All right, uh, welcome back everyone. Dave here again on the Radical Independent. We've got a very special guest today who's been on the show a couple of times and uh, people have really enjoyed his insights and uh, he has a lot to say and some great experience. Of course, he's a former United Nations weapons inspector. He's also a former uh, Marine intelligence officer. So he's had real jobs. Uh, I have not. So I kind of default to him for his expertise. Also, he's got a brand new book out called a Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika, Arms Control uh, in the End or at the End of the Soviet Union. Please welcome uh, Scott Ritter back to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Scott, um, some interesting things have happened since the last time you've been on. Um, Moscow is accusing Kiev of... Um, this assassination, which uh, involved uh, the daughter of somebody who apparently uh, a lot of people uh, in Ukraine weren't too fond of. And the way the West is characterizing this is that, hey, you know, um, this, is, this is what happens when, uh, you know, things get a little out of hand and Russia continues to do their special military operation. Uh, this gentleman, uh, I don't know that much about him. It says that he's a nationalist. He's a philosopher. Uh, he was someone who uh, the West is saying was Putin's brain. This is a thing I've been hearing over and over again, that this was Putin's brain. And um, Kiev, you know, conducted this operation and uh, they were trying to take him out and wound up taking his daughter out, who was a journalist. And, uh, the West has really been rather quiet about, you know, assassinations. And uh, I'm just wondering, Scott, I mean, you know, treaties, you know, uh, what's been negotiated in the past and what the real rules based order is, not the ones that um, the West continues to champion as the rules based order. I actually don't know what their rules based order even means or is, but they talk about it a lot. And this, to me, seems like it might be a bit of a violation of a few rules. And I was wondering what your take was on all of this and if you had any special insights. Well, let's just start off, uh, Colin, you know, it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it walks like a duck, yeah. it's a duck. Right. Okay, this is murder. This is targeted assassination. It's terrorism. Whatever... Um, you know, word you want to put on with a negative connotation, this is it. Okay. This is not justified. This is not legitimate. Uh, this can't be explained away. Shame on the West for trying to do so. If you're somebody who shed a tear for 9-11 and you're not shedding a tear for this, you're a hypocrite, plain and simple. If you're somebody who has condemned the tactics of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and you don't condemn this, shame on you. Shame on the West. I can't say shame on Ukraine. I mean, do you say shame on Al-Qaeda for carrying out its crimes? No, that's what they do. This exposes the reality of the horrific nature of the Kiev regime. It is a terrorist regime. It is a murderous regime. It is a regime that will take a mother. Yes, yeah, she's a serving intelligence officer of the Ukrainian intelligence but take a mother and use her 12-year-old daughter as operational cover so that she can go to Moscow, use her daughter as part of the operation to assassinate an intellectual, not a general, not a civil servant, not somebody who had anything whatsoever to do with the decision-making process that sent Russian troops into Ukraine, but a philosopher. You don't have to agree with the man, but you don't get to kill him because you don't agree with the man. Right. Um, you know, Alexander Dugan is very well known in uh, the circles of people who study Russia. The, the concept of him being Putin's brain is a joke, <laughs> a joke in a heart. I mean, to say this, the reason why something like this is put out is because in the West, uh, there is an effort to transform Russia into a cartoon. Boris and Natasha, Bullwinkle, come on, baby. You know, all Russians speak with heavy, thick accents. And uh, they, you know, I will knock you out. Um, 
uh, you know, the stupidity of this, the notion that a man as sophisticated as Vladimir Putin, um, who has his, his own history, uh, it, it, you know, needs an Alexander Dugan to teach him about Russian nationalism is absurd. Does that mean that Putin hasn't read Dugan? I'm sure Putin has. Does that mean that Putin hasn't met with him? Yeah, confirm it. But I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, Barack Obama, when he was president, met with everybody. Yeah. And with a nobody, you know, with a poet laureate. Does that mean Barack Obama is now forever beholden to the poet? Does the poet whisper in his ear before he's in bed? Uh, before he's allowed to make love to his wife? Does he have to gain the consultation of this poet? No. No one would say that here in the United States about Barack Obama, but oh my goodness, because Russia is a cartoon. Um, therefore, this is Putin's brain. But the danger with cartoons is that when you turn from animation to reality, it gets dangerous at times, especially when you have a Ukrainian government that has outlawed dissent, that has outlawed thought that's different from their own odious ideology. And I want to emphasize this. There is no love loss between me and the Ukrainian government. I, I'm wearing my heart on the sleeve here. They are a neo-Nazi supporting group of thugs. Zelensky is not some honorable democratic leader who is carrying out a Winston Churchill type resistance. He's a pathetic failed comedian, not a failed comedian, actually a pretty good comedian. I want to show, he made me laugh. Okay, so kudos to you, Zelensky. Um, but he's a failed politician. Okay, the man is a failed politician who is being used. He's everybody's puppet. There's more hands up his little puppet controlling hole than you can imagine. Uh, more strings attached to his arms to make him dance to whatever tune. He's not in charge. He has empowered a group of murderous thugs whose ideological allegiance is to Stepan Bandera a man who should be lined up against a wall and shot when he was a young child. They should have murdered or killed him when he was arrested the first time, the Poles. They made a mistake. He was an assassin, a murderer, a thug, death penalty. But no, they released him and allowed him to organize um, hit squads, roving bands of murderous thugs who gunned down Jews, who later on surrounded Polish villages, Russian villages, pulled people out of their homes by the thousands butchered them, raped them, tortured them, murdered them. There's a statue in Poland of children tied to a pole with barbed wire hanging their dead. It's a statue taken from a photograph of the crimes committed by Pandora. Yet we allow the Kiev regime, who endorses this thug, to exist. We empower them. We imbue them with nobility. And what do they do? They dispatch a mother and her 12-year-old child to go murder an intellectual. Again, you don't have to agree with Alexander Dugan. I don't. But you know what? I'm not a Russian, so it doesn't matter. Do you really? I mean, if someone came to me and said, you know, from some, you know, if a Russian came to me and said, Scott, I've read uh, Thomas Jefferson's writings, and I'm, I don't agree with it. I'd say, that's your opinion. Congratulations. I don't care. You're not American. It don't matter. Um, you know, and so if I sit here and say, well, I've listened, I've read Dugan and I believe he's that the average Russian can say, well, A, we appreciate that you read Dugan. B, we don't care. You're not Russian. This is about Russians deciding who we are. You Americans get to wrestle with who you are. Canadians get to wrestle who they are. Uh, it's sort of the, the privilege, the right of a sovereign people to decide for themselves what they want to believe, what their core values are, et cetera. Dugan is part of an intellectual process taking place in Russia to define what the Russian soul is. It's not a crime. It doesn't deserve the death penalty. But because this horrific, odious Bandera regime, which cannot tolerate dissent, which views itself as the representation of this new Aryan race, Ukrainian nationalism means racial supremacy. That's what it means. Understand that. Poles are subhumans. Russians are subhumans. Jews are subhumans. And we support these people. And they went and they committed murder. Why? Because he thought differently. But it's not just an isolated act. Keep in mind, and I, you know, I don't know if we talked about this before, but the 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 um the blacklist. Yeah. The blacklist. Yeah. I'm on the blacklist. Got it. 76 other people are on the blacklist. This blacklist 
is was published on July 14th by the Center for Countering Disinformation. Mm-hmm. Sounds nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what they did is they blacklisted people for the crime of being Russian propagandists. But what does a Russian propagandist entail? In my case, it entailed telling the truth about the presence of NATO bases, permanent NATO bases on the soil of Ukraine. That's Russian propaganda, apparently. Yeah. Telling the truth about the Bucha massacre, that you have Ukrainian security services bragging about carrying out a cleansing operation that targeted any uh, Ukrainian citizen who received humanitarian goods. Apparently to receive a food packet from the Russian forces is a death penalty inducing crime. And that's what they did. It gunned them down. I pointed this fact out. Oh, that makes me a Russian propagandist. And then I said that this is a, a proxy war between NATO uh, you know, and, and Ukraine, again, that NATO is using Ukraine as a proxy to fight Russia. Wow, that's sort of a direct quote from none other than the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. That makes me a Russian propagandist. But it's not just being a Russian propagandist. At, this, at the roundtable meeting where they promulgated this list, they said, these are information terrorists. Yeah who deserve to be arrested and prosecuted as war criminals. Now, what's amazing about this meeting is that the people that put together, their salaries are paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. The U.S. taxpayer is underwriting the salaries of the people putting together a blacklist that includes American citizens whose sole crime is to exercise their First Amendment right of freedom of speech. Now, what's even more important here is that the money that's used to pay these salaries comes from the U.S. taxpayers themselves, put forward in a $40 billion packet approved by Congress, Public Law 117-128, May 21st of this year, sent that money, paid the salaries so they could publish a blacklist and promulgate this blacklist in a meeting on July 14th, organized by a U.S. Congress-supported non-governmental organization, attended by State Department officials who gave this blacklist their green light, their stamp of approval. A blacklist that not only says you're a Russia propaganda, that alone is a chilling impact. That you, I mean, Anybody who is in America nowadays or anywhere in the world understands that given the level of Russophobia that exists, that if you're labeled a pro- Russian propagandist, it is a chilling impact on your ability to be employed. I'm a writer. Mm-hmm. People I used to write for who loved what I wrote, the articles I wrote were the number one clickbait that they had on their sites. Number one. Yeah released me because I'm a Russian propagandist. Okay, screw them. I don't care about them. That doesn't bother me. Information terrorist? Now we got a problem. You see, terrorism. I'm a terrorist? That means what? You put a target on my back? Anybody who now wants to be a hero in the name of freedom, democracy, free speech, gets to gun me down like they gun Dugan down? If anybody else on that list is a fair game? Screw you, Chuck Schumer, who approved this. Same thing with Gillibrand. Same thing with Paul Tonka. Those are my three congressional representatives. Thanks for putting the death penalty up death sentence on me. Because you know there are nut jobs out there who are empowered by this kind of stuff, who believe that killing Dugan was a good thing. A good thing. Now, they didn't get him. They got his daughter. But they don't care. They were going to kill her anyways. He was supposed to be the driver. She was supposed to be the passenger. They were going to kill both of them. They only got the daughter. They didn't get him. It's murder nonetheless. It's terrorism, and it's state-funded terrorism. And you know who's paying the salaries of the woman who carried out that crime? The U.S. taxpayer. What are we doing about it, America? Not a damn thing. We're a pathetic excuse for people. We don't stand for anything. Nothing. We let this occur, and the media is like, oh, well, it is what it is. No, it isn't what it is. It isn't what it is at all. This is one of those come to Jesus moments where people should reflect on what the hell is going on in their name. This isn't Ukraine committing a crime against Russia. This is the United States funding, facilitating, and encouraging crime carried out by Banderist murderers in Russia who ended up killing an innocent girl. You know, oh, she's not innocent, Scott. She she was a journalist with pro-Russia. Oh, my God. So now we're back to if you dare say anything that's pro-Russian, if you dare uh, take a a position that's contrary to Kiev, that gets what it's come down to now, that Zelensky and his Banderas cronies get to sit there and hold court over the world. Ah, he spoke out against us. Kill. Ah, death penalty. 
You dared say something that the Russians believe in. Oh, no, my God, you're not saying that you should bankrupt yourselves and give us 10 billion dollars. You must die because that's what they do. They murder people. These pigs surrounded villages, pulled women out of their homes, raped them in front of their husbands and sons, murdered everybody, including the children, tied to a pole with barbed wire, and we're supporting them. That's where I stand on this Dugan thing. Wow. All right. Well, that's why, you know, Scott, this is why we have you on, because um, the passion that you show for this and the insight that you have, it's, you know, I'm sitting here watching you talk and I'm, I'm just mesmerized by the things that you're saying. And nobody else is really saying this anywhere. You've got a few lone wolf voices out there and they're probably on the same list that you're on, which is unfortunate. Uh, I haven't seen my name there yet. So, you know, it, keep it, working it, on it. Keep working on it. Yeah, You'll I'm, get there. <laughs> keep, keep working on it. And then I'm going to have to check to see if there are any explosive devices that are attached to my car when I go out in the morning. Um, this, this though, doesn't this, doesn't this violate some kind of international rule? Like I said at the beginning, isn't there, isn't there a treaty? Isn't there some kind of agreement that, uh, you know, you can't just go around and trying to, I know this, they, I mean, they didn't take Putin out, right? But this is kind of like a shot across the bow to say, look, you know, if you believe in Russian nationalism, you know, um, we're going to, we're going to make your life difficult. We're going to, um, you know, we're, we're green, as you said, with state, sponsored terrorism, you know, and it seems that our government uh, here in the United States has kind of lost its mind in a lot of areas. I mean, whether you like Donald Trump or not, you have this raid on Mar-a-Lago, which seemed nothing more than a political witch hunt. And, you know, the the archives and the national, it's got to go to this, it, it should have been here, these sealed boxes and, you know, and that really kind of, I think, woke some people up about maybe the FBI and maybe, I mean, and as someone said to me, Dave, this has been going on for quite a long time. It just, now it happened to a former president. So now people are kind of, you know, starting to think about it, but it's been happening to, you know, regular citizens for, for decades. And I think we're, and and you're putting your hand up in the air because you're one of those people. Um, Scott, what, what can you do? I mean, I know your conclusion a lot, when, when you go on these rants is we're a, we're a horrible country, we suck, which I agree with. I agree with, and it's gonna take, you know, an effort by individuals to say, you know what, I'm not even sure 100% what's going on. This is what I hear a lot these days, but something's wrong, something's wrong. Our country isn't a constitutional republic anymore. Um, we are run internally, domestically, like a banana republic and our foreign policy is all you know empire building uh we're gonna we're gonna um you know remake other countries in our own image we're gonna install i remember john mccain remember back in, in this this whole thing started with mccain and lindsey graham and all these neocons who are running around saying oh yeah this is going to be so much better you guys are going to have freedom and democracy and then you know the shelling started you know on the other side of the country the, the you know the um Donbass region and this is why Moscow said you know what I think we need a special uh, military operation to to end this these are ethnic Russians and we just we would like Ukraine to still be Ukraine but we want them to stop doing this and then the entire world reacts and says what are you guys doing I mean don't you just love NATO don't you love the fact that we're encroaching I mean you're surrounding the the country and and again we use that example where is if you know China put a military base in Mexico or whatever, and it was like you know 50 miles or something from the border, people in this country would blow a gasket and they would lose their collective minds, and then there'd be World War III. There would be full blown. You can't do this. I mean, look at the stuff that happened with Taiwan and Pelosi, and everybody's freaking out, you know. And we're basically poking everybody, and we're, we've gone beyond that because we're now sending our money. And by the way, uh, I think we just approved another 775 million bucks for weapons. Uh, did, did we not? And and what is this Democrats and Republicans? Nobody has any restraint, like two senators, one senator, like what is it, Rand Paul? And, and everybody else is like, yeah, it's a good idea. You know, it's, it's like when Pelosi went over, everybody, uh, you, know, you would think there'd be even some tribal opposition to Pelosi. 
because she's such just an, an just an incompetent old fool, right? And she's going over there. I'm hearing people, I don't know, like Ted Cruz or whoever saying, yeah, yeah, well, you know, we we can't we can't allow this to happen. We've got to show strength and we've got to show this policy that we're, you know, friendly with Taiwan and and most people, Scott, they glaze over. They're just like, I don't know. I'm just trying to buy groceries, right? And they don't understand that your groceries are going up because we are printing money for these foreign interventions. We we don't care about individuals here in this country. We really don't. And I'm not even sure, you know, what our end game here, what is our end game? Are we, are we just going to take over the world and become, because we're going to lose. I mean, Russia isn't going to quit. China isn't going to quit. So what, what's, what is this end game and, and how is this going to boomerang back uh, on the United States? Well, you know, when you speak of an end game, um, if you're, if you're, if your goal is to sail across the ocean, mm -hmm. um, your end game is to get from point A to point B. Yeah. Okay, that's that's fine. Now, if you're on that boat and you hit an iceberg and you're sinking, uh, your end game has changed. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. You're desperately trying to bail water, plug the hole, do whatever you can. And so, if I were looking at a captain of the ship that's sailing across, I, I, I could I could make sense. You're navigating. Uh, you're avoiding the squalls. Uh, you're feeding your pe your crew. You're you're making sure everything's nice and good. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Now I watch a captain of a sinking ship. There ain't nothing he's doing that makes sense because he's going from one emergency to the next emergency, to the next emergency. They aren't linked. New things are happening. He forgets the old things. It's just chaos. That's America right now. Yeah. We're a ship in the middle of the ocean that has hit an iceberg called reality, and we're we're going down. And our government is floundering, floundering. You know, let's just start with first principles. We the people of the United States of America in order to form a more perfect union. We, the fricking people. The second you lose sight of that, yeah. you, you yeah. lose sight of America. America doesn't exist without the people because America is the people. Right. We yeah. selected a government that is only exists with the consent of us to govern. That's the way it has always worked for. It's not working that way today. You know, Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people. There ain't no government of the people anymore. Citizens United proved this. We, you know, that was the 2010 Supreme Court uh, ruling that basically powered corporations to be people and throw all the money in. How can you have a legislative branch being the people's house? They keep talking about that, the people's house, when the people have no say in who is in the house. Uh, it's all about money. Try and run for Congress today. Anybody, I challenge you. Go out there and see if you can take on big money because you can't. Yeah. You can't. You can't even get close. Diane Sayers running for uh, for Senate in the state of New York. Uh, she's, um, you know, the, the the LaRouche candidate. Well, whatever you think about LaRouche, that's, that's your business. I don't care. My point is she's running. She doesn't stand a snowball's chance in hell. Not because her ideas aren't better than uh, Schumer's. They, they, she destroys Schumer across the board. I don't agree with everything, but she's better than Schumer. But if this was a battle of ideas, she'd win. Yeah. Um, but it's not a battle of ideas. It's a battle of money and power. And what's happening now is Chuck Schumer can draw upon an infinite um, you know, amount of money that can be brought in by corporations acting as people. Um, same thing with represent. You get elected to the United States Congress. It's a two-year term. You know the first thing that happens after you get sworn in? Your boy or girl takes you over and, and teaches you how to raise money. You spend all your time in a little phone booth calling people up trying to get money. Now, are you calling me? You're really going to call me, my electric bridge? You're really going to call Scott Ritter and ask for what? My $50 donation? No, because they don't care. They're going to call somebody else who's going to give them the big bucks. And then the door's going to knock. Is it me being invited to Washington, D.C. to talk to my representatives? Hell no. It's the corporations. It's the lobbyists. It's the people with the real money. That's because it costs a lot of money to run for office. Uh, so we, we've we destroyed democracy. Until we have meaningful campaign finance reform, democracy is dead. Yeah. We should stop calling ourselves a democracy because we don't function as a democracy. The people don't have a say whom they read. People say, well, you get to go vote. Yeah, but who are we voting for? We didn't put them on the ballot. They did. 
And so the way they work is pretty much whomever we are given choices for, it good for them, not us, because they stack the deck both ways. The one time that this failed was when Donald Trump said, I'm not playing that game. I'm just going to go in and do it. And oh, my God. Yeah. He won the presidency. <laughs> now, and look what they've done to him since then. Right. They've attacked him. They've destroyed him. The establishment is coming down. On him. I'm not saying this because I'm the greatest Donald Trump fan in the world. I'm not. Hey, Donald, January 6th. Bad idea, man. Shame on you. And I will never change my position on that. Right. And I know right now the crowd's going, oh, my God, he's anti. You know, screw you. I voted for Donald Trump. Right. No, I voted for Donald I, Trump because he represented change. Right. But you don't get to violate that, the Constitution. Well, that you know, one of the, there were a few fatal errors there. Not to go into a, a Trump, um, you know, tangent here, but um, you know, you got to. These people are smart. They're they're really smart, and you you telegraph this event, and you know, and yeah, there was a lot of strong rhetoric around the event, but you should know better that um, these these people are going to infiltrate. They're going to. That's my my opinion on it. Is that. I think the whole thing, it's its partial psyop going on with all of that, too. With all, right. that. all I know about, about January, January 6th, the, the, the fundamental thing is Donald Trump was trying to put pressure on Congress, on Mike Pence, yeah. to do something in violation of the 12th Amendment of the Constitution. Okay. How that manifested itself and all that stuff, that's a different issue. Fair enough. There, there's there's yeah. no debate that Donald Trump sought extra constitutional pressure to have somebody operate in a manner that violated the 12th Amendment of the Constitution. Um, Donald, uh, uh, Mike Pence had one job, stand up, convene the Congress and count the votes. And then when the votes are counted to certify the election, there's no other job description built in there. And Trump was trying to get something done differently than that. That's a violation of the 12th Amendment. I'm sorry, Donald Trump. And here's the other thing. The Constitution doesn't belong to Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. It doesn't belong to Mike Pence. Right. It doesn't belong to Congress. It doesn't belong to the Supreme Court. Yeah. It belongs to we, the people of the United States of America. Right. Uh, we are a constitutional republic. Yeah. Uh, whatever whatever uh, powers the republic enjoys are only those granted to them by the Constitution that we, the people, put together. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, we when I say 12th Amendment, how many people even know what it is? Yeah. We the people, do we even know our Constitution? That's my fundamental problem, because we are ignorant of the Constitution. You can't defend that which you do not know. Yeah. And we don't know the Constitution. Therefore, we have punted on every constitutional issue. We've punted to whom? Congress, the people that the corporations bought? Yeah. Supreme Court, that's a freaking joke. Excuse my language. But I mean, it's not about the law. You know, we have nine justices. Um, were they picked because of their legal acumen? No, they were picked because they have a political position that is supported by big money that, that makes it happen. We get a 5-4 decision. What does that mean? Because it becomes the supreme law of the land. The yeah. 5-4 decision means that four of the, of the supposed best legal minds in America disagreed. Right disagreed yeah. and you're supposed to now say no this is the law and everybody has to obey it nearly 50 percent of them said this shouldn't be the law right what does that tell you about the supreme court maybe we should get a constitutional amendment that says unless it's passed seven to two mm. it doesn't become law but yeah. if the supreme court can't agree overwhelmingly that it should be law then maybe it shouldn't be law yeah Wow, imagine that. But we can't do that because this is about leveraging corporate power uh, and, 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 and money. Um, and so well, five, four decisions become the supreme law of the land, even though with one change, suddenly they can decide it should never have been law. I mean, every, I get a little sick of my stomach every time I hear a Supreme Court justice say, well, that Supreme Court decision that was passed eight years ago should never have been law. What the hell does that mean? Then why do we have a Supreme Court? If they're so incompetent that they're passing decisions that should never have been law, then maybe we shouldn't have them to begin with. Yeah. Um, so this we this is a sick society. We are a sick society, and the sickness is not only with we the people who have stopped being function, functioning citizens, we are functioning consumers. 
That's it. Yeah. We live yeah. to consume. And the disrespect shown to us is, 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 is obvious to all. What was the solution uh, to all of our crises? Go out and shop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm you're sure I'm not making to, this stuff up. You're going Go back out to the and Bush. shop. That's the Bush era, right? Remember? Uh, when we were... Trump did it, everybody did it. Yeah. We got to show this this economy only works if you go out and shop. Yeah. So please go out and shop and everything will be okay. As long as you prime the economic pump, pump then the corporations will be able to continue to bribe me so mm -hmm. I can govern you. But I can't do it unless you shop, America. If you stop shopping, the corporations don't have the money to bribe me, and I might not be in office. And it's all about me being in office. It's not about your well-being. So we empower this. We, the people of the United States, stopped being citizens a long time ago, and we're nothing more than coddled consumers. And as long as the government keeps us, keeps us wrapped up in this cocoon of comfort yeah. and doesn't yeah. rock the boat too much, we're happy. We wake up in the morning, we unplug, we go to work, we plug in, we do whatever tasks we do, we unplug, we come home, we plug back in, and it's all based on consumerism. There's very few people that are actually doing the work of citizenship. I'm talking about getting out there and getting in the trenches and doing the good stuff for the for, for, for America. There's a, there's a lot of them. I'm, I, you're listening to me and you're saying, well, wait a minute. I, you're the exception, dude. You know you're the exception because you know you look around you and you're frustrated when you hold your little fundraising event for whatever worthy organization you do and you get 50 people coming out and they all think like you, look like you, act like you, and they have the same bank account as you, which means pathetic. They write their check, which is well-meaning, but it's pathetic because you can't accomplish things with a few dollars. That's mielich. It's nothing. Yeah. It means nothing. You need millions of dollars, millions of dollars. And right now, the way the system is built, the only people that can generate millions of dollars are corporations. Yeah. How can you contribute? How can you even begin to raise money when we got the IRS now deciding that they're going to take a look at any transaction over six hundred bucks? Yeah. What does that tell you? Yeah. That is the oppressive government coming down and controlling every aspect of your life they're going to spend 80 billion dollars mm -hmm. to hire more irs agents so that they can audit you yes. the average american not the corporations the people with the big loopholes you only need one goddamn auditor excuse my language i know that you keep that out i apologize Sorry. one darn darn auditor to audit any big corporation in america to get the billion dollar loophole closed and Suddenly, that's far more effective than hiring 80,000 to come after mom and pa who, you know, are blinking their eyes and filling in the form. And, oh, my God, they, you know, you know, you know, they're going after waitresses. Yeah. Waiters. Yeah. Let's not be sexist. Uh, the people that have a hard time making ends meet because, you know, gosh, they did what the American dream said they should do. And they went to college. Couldn't afford it. But they went to college. They took out the loan. Yeah. And now they're paying the loan but they can't afford to pay the loan, so they have to work three or four jobs. And one of those jobs is waitressing. And waitressing, the the the, 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 the restaurateur, it's, 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 a, it's a secret deal. It's one of these deals that they have in America. They pay you dirt going in. The idea is you get your tips, and then it's always a wink and a nod. You don't declare all your tips. You pocket the tips. It's yeah. sort of the way you go. Is it legal? No. Is it necessary? Yes. Yeah. Is it a crime against America? No but they're going to shut that down. Oh. Meanwhile, the corporation gets to go out there and get the billion dollars. Amazon will continue not to pay taxes. Um, so yay, America, you're doing good. Go after the waitresses and let Amazon get away with anything it wants to get away with. I'm not unhappy that Amazon exists. Right. They provide employment to a lot of people and I would be hypocritical of me to say that I want them to go away because a, I buy a lot of books on Amazon, and B, I'm hoping to sell a lot of books on Amazon. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a writer, you don't write for yourself. It's part of the way you make a living. You write a book, you want it to sell. Amazon is a service. Good, but pay your damn taxes. Yeah. yeah. Pay your taxes and stop letting the IRS hire 80,000 agents to go after the waitresses. Yeah. That's no. not the threat to America. No. We're a sick no. nation. We don't function well. Yeah. And at yeah. the end of the day, oh. what? how does it end up with FBI agents kicking down the door of Mar-a-Lago, going after documents, which were 
legally declassified. Yeah. People can sit there and say, well, he shouldn't have done. Not how the system works, people. I'm not happy about it. But when the president of the United States, who is the ultimate classifying authority, says that's unclassified, it's unclassified. Right. The right. rules don't exist for the president. Mm -hmm. The rules exist to manage declassification for the sheep. Mm -hmm. But the president <laughs> gets to say that's unclassified. And guess what? It is unclassified. And just because it irritates the FBI, and the National Archives, and all those other people, doesn't make it a felony crime. Right. And yet, here we are, once again, the same people that gave us Crossfire Hurricane. That's not me making it up. We know it. Yeah. The same office, the same people launched the raid against Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. The same people that gave us the FISA warrants against um, Carter, Carter Page. Yeah. You know, the ones who lied, affidavits, lied, lied, lied before a judge who knew they were lying, but let them continue to lie. Or a FISA warrant to violate the constitutional rights of an American citizen, not because he was important, but they wanted to get to Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, these same people, the people who allowed Christopher Steele to promulgate yeah. his crap, right? Um, they right. knew he was a liar, they knew his fabrication, but they fed it into the system anyways to get to Donald Trump. These are the same people who are launching the raid on Mar-a-Lago, and we're supposed to go, oh yeah, that's okay. That's okay. It's not okay, America. Yeah. It's not okay. I'm not saying that I agree with what Trump's doing. Look, I've already said, the man is an irresponsible narcissist. <laughs> Whether you have the legal authority to do something doesn't mean that you don't do it right. Yeah. These are documents that contain national security information. You should respect that, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. Just because it inconveniences you to follow the rules doesn't mean that you shouldn't follow the rules because the rules aren't there for you, Mr. President. The rules are there to protect the information contained in the documents. Right. Um, but he, you know, Donald Trump went, no, nope, I want going to do it my way. And the law says he gets to do it. Yeah. So whether you disagree with that or not, it's not illegal. And you darn sure don't send FBI agents to kick down the door of a former president. If you want a civil war in America, keep doing what you're doing, FBI. Yeah. The last thing I will ever do is espouse violence against the FBI. I'm not doing that now. I disagree vehemently with how they behave. I disagree with everything they stand for. They're not a good organization. Right. They're not. Right. If we ever gained access to the totality of their files, we would see the crimes they perpetrate against Americans on a daily basis. They are a political assassination team, not physical assassination, but reputation assassin. These aren't good people. They are not good people. They don't deserve to die. No one should be targeting them uh, physically, but we should be targeting them politically. Yeah. We should be talking about the sources of funding. We should be talking about why they exist. There you go. Yeah. Why do they exist? Because they're not a legitimate law enforcement agency. Nope. Oh, yeah, they got a badge. They got a gun to get around. But they are a political police. Mm -hmm. They are the American version of the Gestapo. They unleash the FBI on you when they disagree with you. How do I know? They've been unleashed on me. They've been yeah. trying to shut me up since 1991. Yeah. In 1991, I carried out the horrific crime of marrying my wife. Yeah. And from that moment on, the FBI has targeted me for destruction. They have done their best, their level best to destroy me. And they've targeted other people as well. Sometimes they succeed. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes they partially succeed. My life has not been easy. My family's life has not been easy. We're still here because I don't play their game. I don't care about them. I think they suck. Hey, FBI, you suck. I have rights. I believe in the Constitution. I believe that the Constitution will ultimately prevail when we, we bring it up. I could be wrong. I could be walking down a plank to go off the ship into the shark infested waters to be eaten. That's okay because I'll jump into that water knowing that at the end of the day, I was doing the right thing. Yeah. I was standing yeah. up for the constitution. You know who doesn't stand up for the constitution? The FBI. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't stand up for the constitution. <laughs> they, they take an oath to uphold and defend a document that they violate on a daily basis. The constitution is an impediment to their work. The Constitution is something to be gone around, not embraced. The FBI sucks. It needs to go away. I wish it would go away today. It's not going to. Why? Because the American people don't know enough about the Constitution to be offended 
by what the FBI does against them on a daily basis. Right, right. Uh, all really, really great points. I mean, another thing I would add to the, the idea about the corporations, right, is now you've got the corporations doing the bidding of, of the federal government. I mean, I'm around a lot of people that are like, hey, man, it's a private company, bro. And I'm like, it ain't so private when they're on the take and they're doing the bidding of the government and everybody's kind of intertwined. We've seen all these government agencies out there that infiltrate. I mean, Big Pharma would be a great example of all of this. And one guy goes off to work for for um, you know Pfizer and then he's working at the FDA. And it's like, there's, there's like, I don't know, incest going on is a good word, I think. I, I don't even know. But um, this whole idea that corporations... Uh, are like independent. Now, not all of them, some of them, but you, when, when they start to tell, you know, states and individuals how to conduct their own personal lives, and this is what we endorse, and you don't endorse this, and, and you're thinking, but you're a company, you're not a government, you know, but it, it's becoming like some of these uh, companies, Scott, these corporations are bigger than, than governments, they're bigger than some small countries, you know, the, the number of people that work for the corporation and their their outreach is global or international. So they start behaving that way. And then they collude, it's a popular word these days, they collude with whatever government is going to help them continue to grow their, their profit margin. But that's, you know, that's a whole other topic and maybe it would be a, a good conversation. So go, go, go into every corporate corporation in America and go to their corporate security office. Yeah. And pull the resumes and bios of the people that staff them. Right. And former then, senior FBI agents, former senior CIA agents, former uh, Department of Homeland Security agents. It's a revolving door yeah. from, you know, we. it's well known what happens in the military. You know, these generals go up, they get involved in weapons procurement, et cetera. Uh, they, 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 they become cozy with a um, military industrial complex. And then when they retire, revolving door, they're on the boards, they're out there doing the same thing. So yeah. that relationship, everybody goes, oh, my God, that's horrible. shouldn't happen. You're right. It shouldn't. Well, you know what else shouldn't happen? You shouldn't be allowed to serve in the FBI uh, doing court, uh, you know, uh, investigating white collar crimes and all this kind of stuff, uh, doing computer security, information security, becoming buddy buddy with these corporations and then retiring to go work for the corporation. No, because what happens? Your entire time as an FBI agent becomes nothing more than an audition for the big job. Because yeah. you ain't going anywhere on FBI salary. <laughs> Been there, done that, not FBI salary, but I've done the equivalent. Yeah. You, you know, the thing about working for the government is if you put in your 20, 30 years and you retire, you will have a comfortable middle class existence. Yeah. Middle class nowadays, though, means that you're going to be struggling the whole time. You're going to be struggling to make payments. You can't afford to send your kids to the great colleges. You right. can't afford... To, to have the lifestyle because you know when you're in the government you get a little spoiled sometimes because mm -hmm. you get to travel a lot you get to go to europe you get to do this you get to you know meet people and all this stuff but now you're out and you're on your pathetic little retirement salary you can't do anything you're, you're no longer privileged enough to go to europe and all this stuff you're you're stuck being mom and pa your big vacation is going to be loading the kids in the car going down to the beach along with all the other proletariat who are sitting on the beach getting sunburned and fat and greasy um, and then you get to come home and you get to worry about how you're going to pay your bills and all that. And uh, if you're lucky, your kids get to go to community college, maybe state university. That's it. If you want something better, then you got to play the game. Right. You got to retire and you got to go into the corporations where suddenly you're making the money that allows you to have the vacation home in the Hamptons, to have the big farm outside of Washington, D.C., to have the ability to send your kids to Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Columbia, uh, Stanford, you know, all the big schools and not worry about, you know, bone crushing student debt. Yeah. Um, that's the game that's played and every FBI agent plays it. They all play. You don't join the FBI because you want to be in law enforcement because you're not a law enforcement officer, buddy. You're a political hit job. You're a Gestapo and you know, it. you may not knew it the first time you went to Quantico and you ran around. You sure learned it on your first assignment when you said, what are we doing? Why are we doing it this way? I thought we were trained, this, but we're doing it this way. No, this is the reality of your job. You're not here to protect the people. You're here to oppress the people. Oh, now the honorable person at that point in time resigns, walks away. But the average person says, well, I, I committed to this. I put this much into it. Yeah. So how, do, how does this work in the end? 
Well, what, what you need to do is work your way up the chain so you get one of these cushy, uh, you know, special agent in charge jobs uh, aligned with either, you know, intelligence, corporate security, IT. Then when you finished, you rotate in. You get the big corporate job. You get to live the life. You got the golden ring. That's what they do. That's what the CIA does. That's what everybody does. They're not here to serve America. They're not. And the generals don't. You learn this as a colonel. You learn this as a colonel because you realize that I had to sell my soul to become a colonel. I didn't get to go from lieutenant colonel to colonel by being a good Marine. I got to do that because I became political. And now you become colonel and you need that star. And to get that star, don't do it by charging beaches. Some lucky few do. They get the opportunity to excel in, in combat and they get rewarded with the star. But most of them have to go out and get involved in selling, uh, you know, buying equipment, procurement, et cetera, making some sort of politicized decision that makes Congress happy, keeps the people that make that, that make money off of defense happy. You get your star. Now you got the one star, you need the two star, then you need the three star. And every star you get, you sell a little bit more of your soul. So that by the time you get four stars, you are full-fledged sold out to everybody. They all. Bring them all on. Any four-star general. Come on, baby. Come. Come to daddy. Let's have a debate. Let's discuss your career. Let's discuss your career decisions. Let's discuss your retirement options. Let's discuss your portfolio, your stock portfolio. Let's discuss every aspect of your life because you're not a four-star general because you were the best Marine ever. Mm. Al Gray may have been the last guy to have that title. You know, Al Gray was a, a warrior's warrior. He didn't play the game. And when he retired, you know what he didn't do? Right. Join boards. Yeah. He retired and he went off to a nice, quiet existence, hoping Marines be Marines, etc. But he didn't right. play the game. He's not Lloyd Austin. Yeah. Who, Went straight off to Raytheon or wherever he went off to, um, you know, and, 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 and I can get, let's just pick the name of all the four-star generals. And when they retire, let's see where they go. Mm -hmm. How many go into a quiet retirement? Those that do, you can say they got there, I believe with some honor and integrity, yeah. but if you flip around and become a member of various boards and you get involved in defense industry, you sold your soul a long time ago. Well, so are the FBI agents. They all suck. Look at James Comey. Look at the rotation he had between the FBI and then, big, you know, you go to a law firm because this is the biggest scam in the FBI. Right. You're, you, if you have your law degree and you join the FBI, at some point in time, you rotate out and you go to a law firm mm -hmm. and where you basically make a lot of money doing nothing more than using your name on the law, the corporate, the corporate law board. And then at some point in time, they rotate you back into government because right. now you got the money. Now you got the money where you can have the home, host the parties, et cetera. Then you rotate out again, bigger post in the law firm, back into the government. You should not be allowed to do this. No. You should yeah. not be allowed to do this. Once, you know, if you're going to join the military, stay in the military. If you're going to join the FBI, stay in the FBI. But the concept of when you get up to mid-level, suddenly being able to rotate out, make money and come back, is absurd in the extreme. The FBI is not about making money. You should not have to go out to a law firm in order to make money to be a senior FBI official. But that's the way it's done because money runs everything. Integrity runs nothing. There's my rant. Nice. Good rant. All right. Let's pivot back to Ukraine because um, one of the other you issues- Calm me that down. <laughs> Yeah, that'll calm that'll calm you down, right? I mean, the first Ukraine rant was was pretty huge, um, but there's this uh, nuclear power plant, Scott, where um, you know Russia has taken over the plant. They did a while ago, I believe, and uh, I'm not sure if uh, Ukrainian former Ukrainian citizens are still running the plant, you know, pressing the buttons, making the plant operate, or if you know the Russians brought their own people in to run the facility. But um, this place uh, has been uh, the subject of, of a lot of concern the last uh, week or so, because apparently um, it's being targeted by, uh, you know, maybe the same folks that carried out the assassination, um, where they're going to fire weapons at this plant and, and possibly damage it. I've even heard people say that, it, you know, the nuclear plant itself 
may end up like Chernobyl and people, uh, you know, the smart people at least are freaking out like this. Uh, this is a real problem. And um, what is going on? Do you know what's going on at this facility? And uh, is there a, a real danger or is this just, you know, uh, some people out there trying to grab some headlines and, and, and make people freak out? Because I'm a little freaked out. I'm just going to be honest because, um, you know, I think the West is is just overplaying their hand with yeah we can we can stand up to Russia we can stand up to China we can stand up to everybody nothing's going to go wrong it's going to be great and uh, on one of our uh, conversations toward the end you painted a, a real stark grave picture about us um, you know trying to take on China and what would happen and sort of the resulting nuclear offensive that would pretty much just end humanity at that point. Just we'd, we'd be all done. So it wouldn't matter about, you know, knowing the constitution because at that point, you know, you'd be dead, you'd be vaporized. So I don't know eh, what what any any of that would do. So my question to you is what's going on with this power plant? Um, it's got a really strange name that I can't pronounce. So if you can pronounce it, that's great. If not, um, no harm, no foul. But uh, I spoke with somebody the other day on this and, and they were they were a little... Um, concerned about it. So what's your take on that? Well, I can't guarantee that I'm not butchering the name as well, but I think the, the pronunciation is the Zaporizhia nuclear okay. power plant. All right. Um, six reactors um, produced during the Soviet Union time, Soviet time, um, built to, I believe, a better standard, a safety standard than the Chernobyl um, reactor. Well, that's incredible. Um, uh, built to... Um, I think it's a different design, so it doesn't have the fatal, um, you know, uh, graphite-tipped, uh, you know, fuel rod problem that caused the explosion uh, for Chernobyl. But it's still a nuclear power plant. Right. Um, it's built to withstand, I believe, you know, uh, an airplane flying into it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's built to withstand a, you know, truck driving into it. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is it's built to withstand artillery shells. Okay. Um, you, you need a very big artillery shell, maybe a thermal barrack munition uh, to, to threaten the structure of the, the, the physical structure of these, uh, of these reactors. But the thing about reactors is um, they, you know, the, the big risk there is power. Mm -hmm. If you cut off power to the reactor, uh, then things can go bad. Safety systems shut down. Reactors start to spin out of control. And next thing you know, you got a Chernobyl um, type incident or, you know, more likely a Fukushima mm -hmm. or a um, Three Mile Island type uh, incident. Uh, Chernobyl was an explosion that, that happened because of a design thing. Um, here we're talking about, you know, a different kind of accident. The, the end result, it's still very much a bad thing. To happen. You don't want it to have happened. So power, power supplies. Now, if you take out the, the, the regular power lines that come in, there's a backup power generator, you know, diesel, um, that should allow you enough time to safely bring the reactor down and shut it down. Um, but if you blow up the diesel or you, know, you, you complicate the scenario and they run out, you don't have enough diesel. Um, if uh, you know, people are siphoning the diesel off because they need fuel, um, you know, then you have a problem. The safety things. If uh, if if all the safety systems aren't um, aren't functioning, then you you may not know that there is a problem when there is a problem, and you're not going to deal with you know the the, the mitigating um, steps necessary. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong um, if somebody's bombarding you with artillery shells that uh, cut power. <laughs> Geez, they've done that. Uh, threaten the safety systems. They've done that. Uh, threaten the backup power. They've done that. Yeah. Um, so all the things that you don't want to have happen are happening now. Um, are they happening as the um, Ukrainians say? Is this a case of the Russians committing genocide against Russians? You know what I mean? I mean, because the Russians on March 3rd took the plant. Why did the Russians occupy this plant? Um, maybe they had intelligence that the Ukrainians were seeking to use the uh, spent fuel rods, and that's the other part of the plan, is you have these spent fuel rods that are in um, in, in storage shelters. Uh, they need to be cooled because the when you pull a fuel rod out of a nuclear reactor, even though it's not you know 
optimally producing uh, fuel. That's why you're pulling out, uh, but it's still very hot. <laughs> it's still very radioactive. And so it has to go into cooling ponds for a certain amount of time. Um, so you don't want these things to be disruptive. Uh, an artillery shell hitting a cooling pond could create a, you know, a, a, an incident, the equivalent of a dirty bomb. And what is a dirty bomb? A dirty bomb is when you take um, contaminated material, uh, radioactive material, and you mix, you know, you get it involved with the high explosive, an event that spreads it. It's not a, it's not, you know, a, 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 a nuclear explosion. Fission did not occur. What occurred though is the, is what, what happens after a nuclear explosion. Radiation is spread and you now have radioactive material around that is hazardous to human life. Um, so Zaporizhia has great risk of, um, of, of, of enabling somebody who had nefarious intent to produce dirty bombs. So the Russian concern was that they had intelligence that the Ukrainians may take spent fuel rods from Zaporizhia and use them to create dirty bombs that would be exploded to um, impede the Russian advance, um, maybe used as terrorist weapons inside Russia. So they wanted to secure this. So they did on March 3rd. Uh, they secured the site. Um, they were also concerned that the uh, Ukrainians would seek to extract plutonium from these uh, spent fuel rods. There's a yeah. lot of plutonium in these spent fuel rods, enough to produce several nuclear weapons. Um, so you want to secure that too. Now, by securing it, what does that mean? Um, physical security. That means that you need somebody to be in control of the site. And the Russian military took on that responsibility. Yeah. There's about <laughs> 500 guys, about a battalion's worth of security forces to provide physical security over the site to ensure that the uh, fuel rods aren't tampered with. Nobody steals a fuel rod to use as a dirty bomb or that fuel rods aren't missing uh, where the Ukrainians could extract the plutonium to create a real nuclear weapon. Um, so there's physical security there. Now, who's operating the site? The site is operated by um, Ukrainian nuclear reactor specialists. Uh, they live in a town. I mean, the way, you know, the way these things work is, uh, you know, this is a major corporation that, that you know, that, that owns and operates these reactors. Um, and they provide energy. I think up to 25% of Ukraine's energy is provided by this, uh, by the Zaporizhia plant. Um, and the people that do this live in a city nearby. And that city is a factory town. Everything about that city deals with the economic activity of this town. Right. Um, there's about 11,000 people, I think, involved in this. Um, they still live there. Yeah. Uh, the Russians have encouraged them to come to work. And again, it's, the encouragement may be strong uh, because you got to keep the reactor going, guys. Um, you're going to work. I'm not going to say they're held hostage. They're not. They could leave if they wanted to. But the Russians have said, we want you to continue working, providing plan. Now, um, because of the war and everything, I believe that four of the reactors have been powered down. They're, they're not operating. The reactors operating because of the artillery strikes. Uh, they are operating around 50% capacity. Yeah. Um, the, the work of these uh, experts is being overseen by Russian atomic energy experts. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Soviet Union built the reactors, which means Russia built the reactor. Yeah. Um, and so Russia, the Russian experts coming in, it's not like you're bringing me in. Yeah. Hey, Scott, go monitor this thing. They're bringing in true experts, people right. who have safety, safety, safety foremost in mind. They're monitoring the work to make sure because these Ukrainian workers now have been divorced from their parent organization in Kiev, the Ukrainian Nuclear Power Authority, whatever you want to call them, the, the Ministry of Nuclear Energy. Um, there's a divorce there. They're not getting that support. Mm -hmm. Things need to happen. Spare parts need to be made available. Uh, salaries need to be paid and all this. So that's being done by the Russians. And so the Russians brought in their atomic authority to oversee this plant, to keep it functioning, to make sure it's functioning safely, and to look out for the welfare and the well-being of the Ukrainian uh, workers who are working there. Um, some people have said this is proof that Russia is trying to take over the facility and divert its uh, energy to Russia. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's no evidence that this is taking place so far. I'm not saying that it won't take place. I'm not saying that there's not a plan in place, but there's no evidence that this is taking place. 
the power that's produced continues to go to Ukraine. Um, it's not that much power anymore. As I said, it's been reduced significantly. And if the Ukrainians keep cutting off the power lines to it, there won't be any power transmission whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but at some point in time, though, Russia will um, take political control of the territory that encompasses the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on what settlement is reached with Ukraine, uh, the power that's produced by this plant um, may be diverted to provide power for Novaya Russia, the new, the new Russia that's going to be created. Um, legally, I don't know how that works. The Russians are very legalistic in their approach. Um, and I believe, you know, whatever peace agreement emerges between Russia and, and, and Ukraine will probably include, um, you know, a discussion of, you know, who owns this power. Uh, who has access to this power um yes possession is nine tenths of the law unless you know you stole it and um and so i i think the the the, the russians may be in a position where they, they say you know ukraine can buy energy from this at a discounted rate i don't know i can't predict the future um but i'm just saying that we don't know what the future is going to hope but whatever is going to happen with this power plant does not justify the shelling of the plant which is what's happening right now. The Ukrainians are bombarding this plant. Um, and it doesn't justify uh, the United States lying about what's going on at the plant. There's 500 soldiers there. They have trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, those trucks are parked yeah. in places. The, the soldiers have, a, you know, they have weaponry. Um, that weaponry requires an armory, maybe requires some ammunition, which will like guys be stored in the vicinity of this plant. This is not, however, the equivalent of bringing in armor battalion or an artillery battalion, digging in uh, artillery pieces next to nuclear power plants so they can be fired off um, hiding behind a nuclear shield. That's a term used by Anthony Blinken, a nuclear shield. He's accused the Russians of using the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as a nuclear shield behind which the Russian military can operate with impunity because the good Ukrainian people would never fire an artillery shell against them because they know what the ramifications are. You're a liar, Anthony Blinken. Yeah. You know it's a lie. The statement you made on Oct on August 1st um, about what's going on in Zaporia is a lie. A lie. If you have evidence that Russia is using the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as a nuclear shield, produce it. You've done it in the past. My God, Cuban Missile Crisis. The Russians have missiles in Cuba. Russia, no, we don't. We, yes, you do. Here's the photographs. We prove it. See, missiles, 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 missiles. Right. Proof, Russia. Well, I guess we do have missiles in, 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 in Cuba. Uh, in the 1980s, he shot down a Korean airliner, killing 62 Americans, including one congressman. No, we didn't. We had nothing to do with that. Oh, here's the audio tape, the interception and communication of your fighter pilot as he comes in, identifies it as a civilian liner, and shoots it down. Oh, yeah, I guess we did do that. Okay, boom. Right. You're using the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as a nuclear shield. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. This is a Chernobyl type event we're talking about. It's yeah. not a minor deal. Big deal. If the Russians are doing this, show me the photograph. Right. You can't because it doesn't exist because you're making it up. But why are you making it up? And here's the issue. They're making it up because they're providing justification for the Ukrainians to shell the plant. Now, initially, Ukraine went, no, no, we didn't do it. The Russians shelled themselves. Because if the Russians wake up every <laughs> drink their 400 grams of vodka and say, shell ourselves, comrades, <laughs> shell ourselves. Because, of course, the Russians are cartoon characters. Boris, Natasha, the drunk Russian, insane, the mad Russian, might as well just shell ourselves. So that's not how they operate. They were shelled by Ukrainians to create a sense of impending doom. Mm. Doom. Now, the Ukrainians will justify this, and Zelensky has come out and said, yeah, we, we, we're, we're showing the thing. So, Blinken, you know, shut up. Your lie didn't work. The Ukrainian government finally admitted they're doing it. Why? Because the Russians are using it for military purposes. We have to respond, they say. Uh, but in order to prevent this, um, the solution now is that the international community must intervene. Mm. Must intervene, not with just inspectors to come in and verify the safety of the plant. That would be nice, but Ukraine won't allow that to happen. Mm. Um, Ukraine won't allow that to happen until the plant is brought under the control of international peacekeepers. Whoa, there we go. The international community is now going to bring in peacekeepers. That means military people uh, who are going to 
take territory away from the Russians. That's a precedent that's being set. Um, they want peacekeepers to come in, take control of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant so that it can be operated responsibly under the control of the Banderist ideological Nazis. Oh, forget that. Um, and then the inspectors can come in. Well, Russia's not playing that game. Russia says, no, we operate this plant safely operated. You're not going to bring in international peacekeepers. We want inspectors to come in. We invite them in. Uh, but this needs to stop. The Ukrainian government must stop. Now, they're shelling it. What are they shelling it with? We've seen a variety of weapons used. But one of the weapons that's alleged to have been used is the HIMARS system. That is the high mobility artillery rocket system provided by the United States to Ukraine. Yeah. The key aspect of the HIMARS is that it is treated as a strategic asset, mm -hmm. meaning that Ukrainians just don't receive it and use it any way they want to. They receive it, and then its operations are coordinated closely with the United States, who uses intelligence information to pick every single target that HIMARS strikes. This means that not only did we pick the prison that was struck, killing 50-some-odd or more, maybe, uh, prisoners, Azov prisoners, are about to go on trial and through that trial process tell the truth about the links between the Ukrainian government, the crimes they perpetrated against the Russian people of Mariupol. No, they had to be silenced. They were silenced with HIMARS. The U.S. picked that target. We facilitated that target. We murdered those prisoners. We're war criminals. Yay. God bless America. And then, But then now we're the ones picking the targets for HIMARS to strike Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We are nuclear terrorists, literally nuclear terrorists. Anthony Blinken, anytime you want to debate me, Jake Sullivan, you too. Hey, Miley, bring it on. Lloyd Austin, let's have this discussion. Congress should be having this discussion, should be calling hearings, bringing people in and saying, what the hell is going on in Zaporizhia? And why is America not shutting this down? It's not about stopping Russia. It's about stopping Ukraine. Ukraine is our client state, using our weapons, targeting those weapons with the intelligence we provided and we greenlit. We're the ones behind the striking of Zaporizhia because this is not about the Ukrainian government defending Ukrainian soil. This is about the United States desperate. Remember the captain of the sinking ship? Yeah. What does a captain do when his ship is sailing smoothly? He yeah. functions responsibly. Right. He is in control. When your ship is going down, you're running around trying to do anything you can to save the ship. This is the equivalent of the anything you can kind of moment. To create a sense of impending doom of sufficient level that justifies the insertion of an international peacekeeping force to do in Ukraine what the Ukrainian military can't do, push the Russians back. Yeah. Well, Russia's not playing that game. Um, they are doing their best to expose the truth about what's going on. They're inviting international inspectors in, and I believe that the international inspectors show up, they will show two things. One, that the Russians have been extraordinarily responsible in the operation of the Zaporizhia plant. Mm -hmm. That at no time has there been any safety problems related to how Russia operates the plant at all. That the only safety problems come when the Ukrainians fire artillery shells into the plant. This is the problem. Um, but the, the, the issue then is um, if the inspectors say that, then how does the United Nations, how does the esteemed Secretary General, who has decided to involve himself in this process, how does he respond to that? Well, he can't. Therefore, you don't let the inspectors in. That's why Ukraine's blocking them. They don't want the truth to be told. Um, how is this going to be resolved? Unfortunately, the only way to resolve it is through the Russians kicking the living crap out of Ukraine even more. Yeah. Thank you, America. Once again, you've created the conditions for the Ukrainian people to suffer. Because the Russian solution now is to drive the Ukrainians so far back from Zaporizhia that no Ukrainian weapon system can strike Zaporizhia. Yeah. Uh, that means more territorial acquisition. That means more dead Ukrainian civilians. That means more dead Ukrainian soldiers. That means more dead Russian soldiers. You've just escalated this conflict. It's not going to work out the way the West wants. This will work out solely to Russia's advantage. I believe the Russians are in control of this situation. Um, they will do everything necessary to ensure that a Chernobyl type event doesn't transpire at the plant. This probably means that they're going to have to start shutting it down even more to reduce the vulnerability, uh, which means less electricity is being produced for the people of Ukraine. Um, let's think about that. The Ukrainian government doesn't care about the people of Ukraine. We know that now. 
They don't care because A, they're not allowing this plant to operate at full capacity so the power generated could be shared with the people of Ukraine. They're shutting that down. And B, they're creating the potential of a Chernobyl-type disaster that will destroy wide swaths of territory, kill tens if not hundreds of thousands of people, and affect the lives detrimentally of millions of others. Yay, Ukraine. Yay, Slava Ukraina. Such great people. And we're the ones backing them up. Russia knows this. The Russians are coming in clear-eyed. They know the nature of the threat. They know the reality of Kiev. They know the complicity of the United States. They have factored all of this into whatever solution they have. And I think you're going to see the Russian solution coming down on Ukraine like a ton of bricks. It's going to hurt. It's going to be big, but it has to happen. Because if you don't do this, if Russia doesn't push them back, there could be a Chernobyl-type event. Probably not. I give the likelihood of that occurring to be very slim. But you know what? I don't like any percentage. Right. I'd like right. that percentage to be as about as close to zero as possible. And yet we're allowing single digit percentage factors to, fact, to, to come into play. And the one thing I've learned about life is if you bet against the minority odd, <laughs> it's going to bite you because eventually <clears throat> they're going to, you know, it, it's going to happen. And in this case, when it happens, it's going to be, it, it would be a huge disaster for the, for the world. So, you know, Russia, they're not perfect. They make lots of mistakes, um, but they have their ship is has not hit an iceberg. Their captain's still in charge yeah. and their yeah. crew is doing things necessary to keep the ship from going from point A to point B. And point B is the accomplishment of every objective set out for the special military operation when it was initiated on February 24th. Yeah. Wow. All right, Scott. Well, um, we've used up an hour already and uh, I kind of thought about one hour would be pretty sufficient. I think we covered the stuff I wanted to cover. Obviously, yeah. you're always welcome to come back uh, uh, if you want to, or if uh, you know I decide to uh, call you and say, hey, we've got this issue. Uh, I mean, it's been happening you know, every couple of days. There's, there's a new issue that I think you're uh, gonna have some valuable insights to talk about. So I really appreciate you coming on. And again, um, uh, feel free to uh, plug your, your book I did at the beginning, but in case some folks may have done a little fast forwarding uh, from the beginning, maybe they, they missed the plug. Um, you, your book is out there. It's going to, you, you mentioned Amazon is going to be selling your book, I believe, starting September 1st. Is that correct? Amazon. Uh, yeah, I think, I think people are already buying it on the book. Uh, the, on it, I don't know, but Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, it, it'll be available to, uh, to the traditional uh, avenues for selling books September 1st. If you want it now, you can get it from the Clarity. Um, uh, uh, Clarity Press is the publisher. Go to the Clarity, Clarity Press uh, website and, um, and you can buy the book there. You know, we just, we just had a, a conversation, um, sometimes heated on my part, I apologize, uh, but uh, that, that pretty much painted a very stark picture mm -hmm. of, um, of where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully, at some point in time, this conflict in Ukraine is going to end. Yeah. And when it does, Russia and the United States are going to have to find a way to work together to create a diplomatic off ramp. Right. Right. Now, there's a lot of people right now saying, "Well, I just don't envision how they can do it." The the world is so bad. I mean, we have a proxy war where we're killing Russians. Um, we're, we have sanctions against Russia. Um, you know, they're arresting Brittany Griner. Um, yeah. You know, and even Dennis Rodman won't be able to save her. Um, Right. You know, the, Dennis Rodman. Oh, no. The, 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 the point is, though, pretty bad. Yeah. It sucked. Mm -hmm. In 1985, we had a situation that was worse yeah. than this. OK, we, we were we were funding the CIA was funding the Mujahideen to kill Russians in Afghanistan. That's a proxy war. Right. We were carrying out sanctioning of Russian energy. But more than that, the CIA was using the sanctions to infiltrate corrupted parts that resulted in a major explosion on a Russian uh, pipeline yeah. uh, inside yeah. Russia. So active sabotage. Uh, they, this wasn't about arresting Brittany Griner. In 1985, they shot and killed Major Arthur Nicholson in Ludwigshafen, uh, a, a Soviet tank facility in East Germany. Um, people were dying. We almost had nuclear war, not one, not two, but three times in the 1980s. And we had an INF missile crisis where both sides were deploying um, 
advanced nuclear armed missiles that were horrifically destabilizing. And one mistake, that fourth almost nuclear conflict could be the one that did it all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Things sucked in the 80s. They really did. Yeah. We called the Soviet Union the evil empire. They called us enemy number one. Right. Um, right. If you had asked people, how can you have an off ramp off of this? People would have said, there's no chance, no chance in hell. But we did it. Yeah. That's what this book is about. This book is a history of the implementation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, um, which was signed by uh, Reagan and Gorbachev in uh, December 1987. It entered into force in July of 1988. And this book covers the first years of this treaty, how we accomplished a miracle, how we literally saved the world from itself, Mm -hmm. how we got two enemies together to work in harmony to achieve disarmament that created the potential, unfulfilled Mm -hmm. potential, but the potential at least for nations living in friendship. Because as Ronald Reagan himself said to a group of Soviet uh, students, in June of 1988, they said, do you still view us as the evil empire? And he said, no, I view you as friends. Yeah. Ronald Reagan yeah. could start viewing Soviets whom he reviled as evil, yes, as is. friends. If we could do it once, we could do it again. George Santayana, American philosopher, once said, those who um, fail to learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat right. its mistakes. Yeah. The only problem with that is that implies that every lesson is a negative lesson that it was a failure, that you're condemned to repeat the failures. Sometimes history actually provides a success, a template of success. And that's what this book is. It's a template of success. So I'll modify it. Those who fail to learn the successes of history are condemned not to be able to repeat them. And that's the path we're headed on today. If we, I put this book out there as a good starting point. It's a great piece of history about a very critical time that nobody knows about. No, no book like this has ever been written in any language. Uh, this is truly the first time the world is going to be introduced to what, 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 what's happening here. I tried to make it entertaining because, you know, humans are humans. And when you throw military people into tough situations, humor comes out of it. And so there's some, there's, you know, it's about life. It's about human beings. Mm-hmm. It's about Americans learning to be friends with Russians and Russians learning to be friends with Americans. That's one of the most important lessons. And then it's about how countries can overcome their own bureaucratic opposition, the opposition that exists both in the Soviet Union and the United States about armed control, how this was overcome by the people on the ground, people doing the job, Russians and Americans and alike. And lastly, it's about this taking place in a unique time in history. It's uh, disarmament in the time of perestroika. Um, So if we didn't have enough problems already trying to implement this treaty, throw in trying to do it as the Soviet Union is convulsing through the radical uh, changes of perestroika. Right. Um, so I like the book. I've, I've written 10 books to date. This is my favorite, my all time hands down favorite because not only it, it's almost autobiographical, uh, I have to use me as the venue to tell the story. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's a lot of me in this book, but it's also one of the most transformative times in my life. I went from being a Marine who was trained to kill Russians to being an arms controller who learned to live uh, and operate as friends with Russians. Um, and even though I don't discuss it in the book, uh, it's where I met my wife. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't fall in love there. You weren't allowed to fall in love there. But I met her. And that that friendship we talk about where I was able to view the Soviet people as human beings allowed me to view her as a human being so that later on, uh, when the opportunity came, uh, we were able to um, you know, fall in love, get married, and um, have what you know, thirty-one years of marriage um, this this month. So uh, awesome. success. Um, so it's it's a book that just means a whole lot to me, um, and, th- and that's why I wrote it. And uh, I would encourage people to to read it. All right, and uh, that was a you know you can't you can't beat uh, you know any other kind of marketing than the author himself uh, sharing a, a lot of insights and details and a lot of enthusiasm. Scott, again, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, you are certainly my most popular guest that I have on. Um, the videos go far and wide. In fact, uh, some of this stuff has even been copied and sent different places. I get these notifications that, you know, there are copyright violations coming in all over the place. And I just, I just let it go because I want uh, people to see these videos. And there might be somebody who's a little more charismatic than I am, who's 
sharing the information with folks. I don't really care as long as people get the truth. And again, um, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, hopefully, again, we'll uh, we'll have another conversation uh, in the in the future. Oh, thanks for having me.